And let us pray, brothers and sisters, as we hope to live in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Good and gracious Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the blessing of this day, this evening for some. Thank you, Lord, for the peace and freedom to be able to share your faith in our societies. We pray for those who do not enjoy those freedoms. Help us, Lord, to sacrifice for them. Jesus, I thank you this morning for the privilege of teaching your people. May they hear only what you would have them hear. And may I say only what you would have me say. May we be a blessing to one another in the different places on our planet that we share in unity. Help us, Lord, to earnestly pray for the needs of the church in this time of substantial struggle and unprecedented challenge. Holy Spirit, I ask you to be present in this meeting today. And Mother Mary, I ask you to place your mantle of protection over us so that we may delight the sacred heart of your Son. For it is through you alone, Lord Jesus, that we live and breathe and have our being. To you alone, then, do we give thanks and praise through the immaculate heart of your most holy mother. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So um, I think that I have been given the ability to screen share. So just to orient you, and then I'll take it back off. Um, what you see that you would need in front of you would be this kind of a handout, which will be the first of two teachings, I understand. And you see it, this. So we'll review this and then briefly refer to this handout, which follows it and then briefly refer to this one which follows it, okay? And that'll be where we, where we go today. And hopefully we'll have a good chance for questions. Um, so what I wanted to start out with, one of my favorite people, period, I pray to him every single night with my family in prayer. We're all collected on the bed when we pray. We just kind of like pile onto my big master bed um, with my wife and my six kids and such. And we all pray kind of together. And for many years, among those we intercede to is, is now Saint uh, John Paul, uh, Pope John Paul II. And one of his greatest documents, actually one of his very first, at the very beginning of his papacy, um, was a document called Redemptoris Hominis, the Redeemer of Man. It's simply um, a superlative document about Jesus himself which is appropriate enough for this very Christocentric Pope that would become. So way back in 1979, was it when his astounding 27 year pontificate was just beginning, he wrote this document and it became thematic for everything he wrote thereafter of his m masterful papacy. And he wrote this, this, this quote, which most of you have probably heard in some context or another. And it's just simply Christ the Redeemer fully reveals man to himself. Christ the Redeemer fully reveals man to himself. Now we're about to dive into an area of doctrine called social teachings, social justice and such, and, and some other elements to it, and give you its five main principles. But the main thing I want you to remember is everything about this complicated and detailed area of, of teaching of the church comes back down to that sentence. So I don't want all the detail to get lost, the simplicity of what the essence is of the church's teaching about how we live in communion with each other. The bottom line is that to understand what you and I are supposed to be, the model isn't the church or some government or some era or some papacy or some document. The model is simpler. It is simply the life of Jesus lived again in you. And to understand who you are and what you could be and what he wants you to be, you simply look to his person, not his teachings only, but his very person. Christ reveals you to yourself. So to figure out what you're called to, and all of you are young, what you're called to, you're not necessarily looking for a very complicated thing. 
you're looking to find your center in what it means to really deeply know what the God-man, what Jesus thinks and does and would want you to be like, as you called to be a repeat of him. And yes, we'll learn complicated things as you've been doing through the catechism for weeks and weeks and weeks now and weeks on past this and past when we talk. But remember that the gospel is simple. Sometimes the church's teachings are so deep, so broad, so thorough, so logical, that the details of it makes us lose the simplicity of the gospel. And your main work is not actually any learning of that detail, firstly, though it is important and certainly helpful. Your main work is to vibe the person of Jesus yourself. And that means your main work in being what you should be, which this whole area of doctrine calls you to, is to learn Jesus very deeply. And there's no other way to do that than by a very strong contact with the Gospels themselves. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? It's the books you never leave. It's the place you always return to so that you can become deeply steeped in, if to use a cooking term, right? Marinated in Jesus. So that you're gradually, you instinct what he would think and do in the various circumstances that you face as a young person. There's no substitute of any other type of study of your faith for deep, abiding, constant contact with the Gospels themselves on your own. I know you all hear them at Mass, and that's good, but your own. In our family, we are constantly reading the Gospels in the mornings. I've been through the Gospels many, many times with my children in morning readings over a period of years, one chapter a day. Sometimes we stop for long periods if we're doing vacation or whatever, but I want them simply to hear the voice of the Savior and the Savior's actions and the Savior's sacrifice, because that's the way that you become what you're made to be. For this area of doctrine, obviously, what we're talking about here is challenged by all the different cultures in which we live. And we represent many different cultures here. Um, and I wanted to use one thing to kind of unify them. I have in my hand here a feather, but it's not just a feather. It is, if I pull it very close to your screen, it is actually cut in its tip in a very precise way that takes quite a bit of skill to cut it just that way. It's not just a quick slice off like they do in the movies. This is a feather pen. And it's cut, its tip is cut in a very precise fashion with a very particular blade. And when they used to use feather pens, obviously that's not our way of writing now, this kind of thing was done in a sense by an artistic cut to make possible something extraordinary from something ordinary. A feather is a very ordinary thing. So my analogy that I wanted to start out with is, think of the feather as you. We are what we are. We are, we are the ordinary, beautiful making of a creation of the Lord. But he takes our ordinariness and he wants to do something different with it. And it requires shaping such that it can be a precise instrument for him to do something that without that shaping would leave it unable to do works like this. This, some of you might recognize this instantly. This is an, one page of over 600 pages of a document that was done 1,200 years ago, around the year 800. This is from the famous Book of Kells, named after the Abbey of Kells in Ireland. And it is the premier illuminated manuscript that was produced at that time. Nothing exceeds its quality. And it is considered one of Ireland's national treasures. I'm half Irish. This, this incredible thing is a single page done on sheepskin vellum this is simply the letters chi rho, P-X in, in the English alphabet, 
which are the first two letters of Jesus's name in Greek. And this is what some artist did with it by hand with a little thing like this. It's considered one of the most magnificent hand-done pieces in the history of the church. And the book that it comes from, the book of Kells, which is basically a book of the Gospels, has hundreds of illustrations of like kind throughout it, small and large. You and me were ordinary, but in the hands of the master, we become capable of something much more than ordinary. And that in trusting Mother Church, in trusting her teachings, and in looking to the face of Christ, enables your life to become like the life of this feather, something that was made for something greater than its original making, beautiful though it is, as is, to become something that could create something extraordinary for God with your life. That's his intention, and it only occurs upon the feet of you trusting him. Because everything in the social teachings of the church these days is countercultural, is unexpected, challenges us where we are, challenges us in a particular way, especially in a material society. Uh, Singapore, Indonesia, Jakarta, all, uh, all the places of America by and large are very heavily materialistic cultures at this point in their history. And the social teachings of the church make us uncomfortable. And that's why I stress this at this moment and take the time to stress that if what you want in your life is two things, joy and peace, I don't know any of you very well, but I know that all of us want that. I know one thing about each of you, that you want joy, real joy, not just transient happiness and you want peace of soul. And those things only come when you put yourself firmly in the master's hand, and despite anything else that the world would teach you, you realize that Jesus's role with you is to do a refinement that's often painful and often challenging to those around you. So let's dive into this with that expectation that there are parts of it that will make you substantially uncomfortable and challenge you in that key thing that you have with Jesus, which is, do you trust him okay. with your joy? So onto the sheet, you will see there, it says beyond the title at the top and the catechism paragraphs it references. You will see there, it says below that, a quote from the, uh, uh, the Old Testament book of Zechariah. It says there in italics, very top. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy, each to his brother. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against his brother in your heart. The first thing, and the first thing to fill in if you're doing a fill in the blank, other than taking notes in other manner, the first line there below that quote says, love of neighbor is inseparable. That's the word that goes in there. Not able to be separated. Inseparable from love of God. Love of neighbor is inseparable from love of God. And there it gives a long citation from James 2, which I will let you read, because it's the bulk of that chapter which talks essentially about that any other thought of following the gospel is void if you do not care for the widow, care for the orphan, and similar things. Love of neighbor is inseparable from love of God. It is impossible to say you love God if you do not love your neighbor. Defined is the way James defines it. The next thing down, it says, all are called by God into friendship into true love with every other person. Every is the word that goes in the next line. Every other person. Emphasize because it's easy to sort of gather around us those that make us feel most comfortable and most affirmed, right? In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, it says, if you love only those who love you, what credit to you is that? Do not thieves and tax collectors do the same? 
So the challenge is, you know, one of the friars here, one of the Franciscan priests at Franciscan University said it this way in a homily. He said um, that nothing great ever happened inside your comfort zone. Nothing great ever happened inside your comfort zone. God's desire is to take you to the edge of your comfort zone, knowing that he will not push you too far, but the growth only happens in that place. So every other person, the social doctrines of the church, next line down there in the handout, the social doctrines of the church reach out and bite you. Bite being the word you fill in. They reach out and bite you. Hmm? For an example of that, we have here on a screen share briefly, um, we have on your handouts, you see this image. It's a familiar one to many people. Um, it is Jesus, of course, at the Last Supper, and Peter, looking rather pensive, sitting above Jesus, um, with his hands kind of clasped together. And it's hard to tell, perhaps, in this image, but if you look in the background, you can see, like right here, there's actually an apostle that is grasping his head like this. He's completely scandalized by this. That this is, of course, the very end of Jesus's time on earth, prior to his resurrection, prior to the crucifixion, the night before he was taken, right? The night uh, going into that Thursday, Holy Thursday. And obviously the Eucharist was given on Holy Thursday, but this action, this famous action uh, was done. And this is, of course, they all knew who he was by then. Not everybody in the world did, but the apostles did. They understood that he was God on earth. They understood that he was the son of the father. And here he was stripping himself down, putting a towel around his waist and washing their dirty guy feet with his own hands. An unprecedented action of condescension. And they were completely unhorsed by it, completely scandalized by it. And yet Jesus said, that's why the Holy Thursday is often called mandatum. It's the mandate, meaning he says, I require you to be a leader like this, to live like this, to set an example like this, that you're not to lord it over others. That's not Christian leadership, that you're to be like I am a leader. And he didn't just say, be a servant type. This, what you see here is radical servanthood. It's a radical laying down for the good of another to set an example. And he said, this is the example. My, um, my mentor at Franciscan University, uh, who was a founder of the catechetics program here back in the late 90s, uh, I was under her mentorship. Her name was Barbara Morgan. And there's a legacy section on our site that has lots of her teachings, which I strongly recommend you take. They're all free audio and video. Um, it's in our resource section of our franciscanathome.com site. Um, and uh, we've assembled the best and finest teachings that she ever gave through 10 years of serving here as director of catechetics and founding the program. And Barbara used to say to me, you know, the social doctrines of the church always makes me uncomfortable and think about how many shoes I have in my closet, she used to say. You know, like she had shoes, you know, whatever with different things, slippers on up. And she said, the social doctrines bite you. They reach out and bite you because they make you really think about your personal steps in the world, your personal choices. Taken in deeply, the social doctrines of the church leave nothing in your life untouched. And that's very important because the nature of conversion following Jesus, as we've discussed, requires there to be nothing untouched in your life. That may take a long time if for each of us, and God's patient. But to do another screen share with the Vatican document, I wanted to point out that following the social teachings isn't just saying, I'm going to make a list of things that I should think about. It actually requires an openness to a depth of conversion. Here you see a document called the Compendium of Social Doctrine. Probably most of you will never read it. I have not read the whole thing. It's a big fat book, but it is all online for free in the Vatican website. And I wanted to point you to just one single paragraph. And it says here, the inner transformation of the human person 
in his being can progressively, meaning gradually, right? So it's not all at once this happens. In his being progressively conformed to Christ is the necessary prerequisite for a real transformation of his relationships with others, which is about social doctrine. The inner transformation, it says, is the necessary prerequisite. So personal conversion. It goes on to say, it is necessary then to appeal to the spiritual and moral capacities of the human person and to the permanent need for his inner conversion so as to obtain social changes that will really serve him. The acknowledged priority of the conversion of the heart in no way eliminates, but on the contrary imposes the obligation of bringing the appropriate remedies to institutions and living conditions when they are an inducement to sin. In other words, structures in society are sinful so that they conform to the norms of justice and advance the good rather than hinder it. Another way to put this is, you know, I spent a long time as my bio mentioned as a crisis pregnancy center counselor for nine years. That was dealing with one woman at a time who was in a crisis situation and needed help, often teenagers. Some one couple of them that I had over the 250 women that I saw over that time was, was 12 years old. And you know, there's only one reason you step into a crisis pregnancy center, right? Because you think you're pregnant and you don't want to be, or you're struggling with that. And in this circumstance of dealing with one woman at a time, one person struggling at a time, you realize that the pro-life movement, for example, is not only or even firstly about changing laws. Laws must be changed. But it is firstly, as this paragraph points out, about the inner transformation of each person. It's about one heart at a time. That we could change the laws in society that might allow abortion but if we don't change hearts, we make little progress if inner transformation is not the focus. And so all the things about social doctrine that allow us to consider structures in society and talk about them, talk about authority and talk about how government should do this or that or how citizens should do this or that, all those structures in society are subordinate to the primary work, which is never forgetting that it isn't about the structures, it isn't about the laws firstly. It's about inner transformation. And so being in the field of souls, people who work in ministry like myself and Katrina, yourselves in leadership in different ways you witness in your own place, just as Christians, as young people, it's important to remember that structures are subordinate to the heart and that learning how to gently, lovingly witness, gently, lovingly persuade and challenge gently is the primary work of the Christian in society. Hmm? So having said that, below this, you see several bars, if you will, dark bars with words and then stretching down this page that I had pointed out that is all these fill in the blanks. Five of them, the first five, each have a question. They are the five main points of the social doctrine of the church. So I've made them into questions that we consider and points under each. So the first one it says, and I'll strip down them real quick so you can see the context. The first one says, this is in the dark bars, stretching down the page, respect for the dignity of life is the first one. And it says a question. Do people derive their value from their usefulness? The second dark bar down says, each person has a call to end sinful inequality. The question then is, why are there inequalities? And this is a good question, right? God's all powerful, all knowing, created everything, is all good. Why are there inequalities if he's, all, if he's in charge and he made everything? Why are there inequalities? That's a good question. The next one down, the third one, Authority and its proper understanding. What is the purpose of being governed? Hmm. What is the, why should you allow yourself 
to have another human being which is equal to you in dignity govern you? Why should that be okay with you and under what circumstances? Is it okay? The next one down, second to last of these five is subsidiarity. Why must those higher give deference or consideration to the rights of those lower? Why do we need to concern ourselves if we're above? Why do we need to care for those lower? Other than guilt trips and simple answers like that. The last one down there in terms of these five is common good. It says, how do human rights relate to individuals and the common good, often intention? How do you parse the common good versus individual desires, rights, will, the individual's good versus the common good? How do you sort that? Because they seem to often be in conflict. These five areas are the five pillars of the social doctrine of the church, covering a large swath of the catechism in the third pillar, the pillar on the moral life. But the primary one, to go back up to the top bar, is respect for the dignity of life, because that is the prime pillar. All the others derive from it. All the others flow from its establishment is why does it matter that you exist? Why should it matter? Why do you have any dignity at all? What's the source of your dignity? So three points under that. And again, this is where fill in the blanks apply. Society is ordered to the person. That's what goes in the line, the word person. Society is ordered to the person. The person is not the instrument of society. Now, that may seem obvious to some of you, but is a radical statement, especially in light of governments in Asia, Russia, other places like that, um, communism and such, which does not acknowledge what this sentence just says. That society is ordered to the person. The person is not a cog in a machine that society just simply says, your place is to make society run. Therefore, you are subordinate to society. It's not the way the church thinks. It's not the way the truth is. That the prime reality is the dignity of the person, which nothing subordinates and nothing has higher value than. So having said that, the next bullet is Christian life orders this world's goods, that pair of words, this world's apostrophe S, goods to God and fraternal charity. Christian life takes the stuffness of this world, all the things that it is, and orders it to God and fraternal charity. In other words, purposes it properly. You know, it takes what is ordinary, like yourself, and aims it by refining it to be of great value to God's plan and to charity, fraternal charity charity among the brethren. It takes what otherwise could be just ordinary things in society and makes them actually purposed for the greatest good they were made for. Hmm? You know, you could say it this way, you know, why did God give you a voice? Your voice being good. You, you know, your voice can do things like order a hamburger at McDonald's. Katrina tells me you can actually, in your part of the world, order rice at McDonald's. I think that is totally cool because I love rice. But that is fascinating to me because that's like inconceivable here from a McDonald's. Anyway, but you're, you can order food from a drive through with your voice. But that's not the purpose of your voice, is it? The purpose of your voice is to praise God and speak his goodness into the world. That's why your voice was given and you can order hamburgers with it, right? So it's a matter of taking this world's goods and making sure that they aren't purposed in the wrong direction, missing what they are made for fundamentally, right? 
the third bullet there says, we are called to develop, the word develop is what you put in the line. We are called to develop your gifts for others. You're called to develop your gifts for others. And the dignity of labor, the word labor, arises from this. You say, you know, a lot of young people are like, I want to get a job that makes me feel like I have a purpose. And some jobs are more so and less so, at least obviously, right? And especially when you're young, sometimes you don't get jobs that feel as purposed as jobs you might get later in your life, you know, or, or bigger things. But the church's understanding of labor and its dignity, work and its dignity, doesn't arise solely from the perceivable worldly purpose. You know, am I powerful enough or am I a director of something? But it calls, it calls us to think about labor as dignified because in any form that it can be, from collecting trash on the street to running governments, that if it is something that you are doing that is a gift to others, a service to others, it has dignity precisely because it is a form of giving yourself to others. And any labor can have dignity under that context, even to the degree that if I had a, a very menial job and it enabled me to earn a living such that I could give an education, a warm home, a safe upbringing, a Christian experience, to my six children, then that labor, no matter its type, has dignity because it enables me to do that for my children. It enables me to serve. So your purpose of your life is not necessarily to say, is my job like amazing in this world's eyes? but does it at least in some way allow me to give myself to others, even just because it earns me the money I need to act in a certain way? Because your whole life will have worth exactly to the degree that you gave it away to another. Exactly to the degree that you view your life as your day, your hours as, my role is to give myself away. That is the source of true peace and true joy that we talked about earlier because it is exactly what Christ came to be. Of the forms that it took in Christ's life and the forms that it took in yours are different. But Jesus came to be a man for others, as you're well familiar with. And as Pope John Paul says, Christ fully reveals man to himself. What was the source of how Jesus sought to please his father, to be fully at peace, to have joy that surpasses the pains and the sufferings that he gave and make them worth it. It was to live as a man for others. That is fundamentally what produces true happiness, true peace, is as you live your days, aim your life to be a man or a woman for others. It is that simple, the key to happiness. So your dignity arises from that mission that you were made for that. You weren't made to serve society, to serve the widgets that need to be made in some factory. You were made to please and delight the father by being like him and his son, by giving yourself away. Nothing can take that dignity from you. No government can acknowledge it more fully than it already exists in you. No awards or medals. You know, I used to be in the U.S. Navy and, you know, had little medals and bars and stuff like they do. None of those acknowledgments of service are important to what I already am and what you already are. Your dignity is inherent. It's not chosen or bestowed by degrees. It's not chosen or bestowed by awards and acknowledgments. It is simply the pre-existing reality in you that you're called to the highest thing that you can be called to, which is to allow the Lord to refine you by his teaching and learning 
refine you such that you can give yourself away as fully as possible by the time you take your last breath. That's your goal. So the next line down, the next line down in the dark bar, each person has a call to end sinful inequality. So why are there inequalities? I love this quote. Again, I'll screen share with you. It is on your handout, but if you don't have your handout up or don't want to switch to it, you can look at this handout back again to this picture, but look, if you will, on the right side of the page, right here where my cursor is. It's a quote from St. Catherine of Siena in a dialogue with God. And she often wrote, believe it or not, in the first person for God, God talking to her and telling her things, which is a very unusual writing style. And here she's writing, speaking as if God is saying a certain thing. So this is God speaking to Catherine, answering the question of why are there inequalities? God says to Catherine, up here in the top right, I distribute the virtues quite diversely. I do not give all of them to each person, but some to one, some to others. I shall give principally charity to one, justice to another, humility to this one, a living faith to that one. And so I have given many gifts and graces, both spiritual and temporal, with such diversity that I have not given everything to one single person. Why? so that you may be constrained to practice charity towards one another. I have willed that one should need another and that all should be my ministers in distributing the graces and gifts they have received from me. Why does the Lord allow inequalities? because his purpose is not to make you perfect right off the bat. It's to make you perfect through serving others and needing others authentically in your life. Many people in the US are like really focused on, as you may be as well, but our culture is very strong in this regard of having an independent mind, right? You know, like freedom, you know, freedom can often mean independence from stuff, from tyranny or whatever from whatever, freedom from regulation. And it's a very strong cultural reality in the US to think freedom and independence are always associated, that the more independent you are, the more free you are. But the Christian understanding is different. The Christian maturity is not a measure to be mature in the faith, as you're all striving to be. To be mature in the faith does not mean I am independent of this or independent of that. It actually means that you have wisely and prudently realized your dependence. It means that you have learned in maturity to lean on another. Because as my mentor Barbara Morgan used to say somewhat humorously, she phrased it this way, we are saved in bunches. We're not saved alone. We are saved as a community, as a society, and we're made to need each other, not to mature out of the need for each other, such that maturity is like, I don't need people. I'm on my own. I'm tough. I'm, I'm you know, all that. That's not what Christian maturity is about, nor is it meek or wimpy either. It is a serious recognition that the purpose of Christian life is to lean into those things that you need to grow in, in others, and to recognize that you're not the cat's meow, as we would say, all that, all one thing, that Jesus has not allowed that in his great wisdom, that not anyone is fully Captain America in every regard, 
fully got all the strengths, all the talents, all the wisdom. That's not his purposing in the world. His purposing is to learn to need another and to give yourself to others. And that makes for real joy because it makes for authentic sharing, not authentic growth away from others, which doesn't help you reach peace and joy in any authentic way. Uh, you might notice that this, is, this principle is lived out in the sacraments. Do you notice, have you noticed that all seven sacraments which are the most powerful extension cords to heaven, right? They are the things that give you the real electricity of grace par excellence. The most powerful helps that God allowed, the sacraments, the most powerful sources of grace. God instituted each one to require another human to give it to you. Did you notice that? He's made all the sacraments not available from God directly. Like every baptism. Can you baptize yourself? No. Not even in the case of emergency. It could be the case that if you had to and you were dying and you were injured and there was a dirty puddle next to you of water and a Muslim person was nearby and was willing to do so and he said, can you please baptize me? And he said, well, I'm not Christian. And he said, no, just say the words and and that intention will be enough. And that would be a valid baptism in a case of emergency. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That very unlikely scenario would actually be a valid baptism. But you can't baptize yourself. Not even a priest or a bishop can baptize themselves, right, in any way. You can't give your own confession. The Pope can't turn his sort of like mirror around and confess himself. He needs a confessor, right? Every sacrament, of course, matrimony, right? Can't marry yourself, right? Every sacrament requires, has been implemented and instituted by Jesus in a way that requires us to need another human to have it occur. Do you note that? Even the sacramental system requires leaning, requires dependence. This is shot through the faith. Christian maturity is about learning to lean properly and to give yourself for those in need. And that's why the Lord has allowed inequality, so that we would be constrained to give and receive charity as a substantial and fundamental and inescapable part of every life. In the Lord's wisdom, it says you have to trust, right? You have to trust because this is so countercultural. So below that, in the dark bars below that, it says, the goods of creation are destined for the whole human race. The goods of creation are destined for the whole human race. Not some particular powerful set of them. Hmm? The whole human race is what goes in that line. The next bullet down, it says, anything above, and here's where it gets tough, anything above our need, in accord with our state in life, right? The Franciscan friars at Franciscan University across the hill from me here, and me as a dad of uh, six kids, we have different states in life, priests, Franciscan, and me as a layman in the world and in marriage. We have different states in life. So anything above our need in accord with our state in life is not our right to hold selfishly, is what goes in the line, is not our right to hold selfishly. Now look at the sentence again, please. Anything above our need in accord with your state in life, and I know some of you are still figuring out your state in life, that's fine, is not our right to hold selfishly. It doesn't mean you give everything away above your need. That's not what it says but it is a recognition that above what you need for your state in life, you're not to assume is just all mine. I need to think no further about it because the goods of creation are made for all. Now within that, some interesting points, the next one down, our entitlement, you could say our right to goods, to stuff, 
ends in our needs. Ends is the first word in the line, and our needs, our entitlement to goods, to stuff, ends in our needs. That's why, and a very interesting thing of social doctrine that most people aren't aware of, that the taking of goods for survival is not considered theft, is not theft. In other words, if someone is struggling or starving and they're trying to feed their family and they go steal to, to accomplish that, the church does not see that as a sin. It's not the th sin of theft. Why? Because someone with surplus and someone in extreme need, there is not an absolute right to the surplus that overmasters that person in needs need to have it. Hmm? Our entitlement to goods ends in our needs. Now within this, the next bullet down says private is the word that goes in the line. Private ownership of property, private property must be respected. The church has always been very clear about that. Hmm? which is why it's always opposed communism, which eliminates the, the understanding that private property is a thing, right? It does not recognize that reality. So private ownership of property must be respected. However, next bullet down, private ownership is not absolute. That's what goes in the line, is not absolute. Since everything is a gift from God, everything is grace. So meaning, yes, it's important to realize we have a right to own, but that doesn't mean that right is absolutely above every other consideration because the first consideration is the dignity of others and their need. And that trumps the right to private property under certain conditions. It's a very important principle to recognize because we live in a stuff rich society. All of us do, right, in various ways. And some of us are very well off or less so, but either way, we're, we're better off than many. And that asks you to consider this reality. Remember I said, the teachings of the church in the social doctrine, they reach out and bite you. <laughs> Right. Get less sunshine here. They reach out and bite you. They challenge you to think about what's in your closet, how you choose your purchases, what you do with the money you earn. Hmm? And not challenging you on the terms of saying, oh, the church will always make you feel guilty so that you must give away stuff until you feel less guilty. That's not the plan. Remember, this is, as I said at the very beginning, very importantly, do you trust God to refine you so that you can make something more beautiful of your life than you could without him? This isn't about, the social doctrines aren't about, uh, I just have to not feel guilty and I have to give away stuff so I don't, so God's not mad at me crossing his arms and being upset with me. That's not what it is. It's saying, do you trust him with your joy? Do you trust him following these kind of teachings to lead you a place, to a place that is better than what you would have had without it? Not just simply ending a guilt trip. Do you trust him? The next one down is about a totally different area. What is the purpose of being governed? authority in its proper understanding. What is the purpose of being governed? And then first bullet under that says, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one right above that. Let me revisit the top area there. It says, um, the bullet, the last bullet in the previous section says, labors, for those of you who may end up in charge of people or already are and have employees. It says, laborers, workers, are owed a just wage just is the line, a just wage. 
and we owe special care to the poor and others in need, as I have stressed. Hmm? You know, in, in the Old Testament, it says the defrauding or the, um, uh, the sinful uh, reduction in wage that is below a just wage is one of those sins that cries out to God in heaven. That's how it's described. Laborers are owed a just wage, a living wage, regardless of what society's standards are. Hmm? So now back down to the section on authority. The first bullet there says civil is the word that goes in there, C-I-V-I-L. Civil authority meaning governments rather than church, civil authority has a legitimate right to provide for the needs of society and thereby to be obeyed. Hmm? Obeyed is the word that goes on. Paul says it this way, St. Paul. This is Romans 13, which is referencing there. He says, let every person, St. Paul, let every person be subject to the governing, governing authorities. Now, remember what kind of government he's talking about here. He's writing this in the book of Romans. And at this time, were the Romans all that friendly to the Christians? Yeah, right. So he's writing it in that context. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, he writes. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Right? Remember, Jesus said that to Pilate, who was not being friendly to him either. You know, Pilate said, you know, uh, do you not know I have the power to crucify you? And Jesus said, you would have no power unless it was given you from above. Remember he said that? Verse 2 in this chapter 13. Therefore, Paul writes, he who resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to, to good conduct, but to bad. Why would you have fear of him who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, meaning the government. Does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God to execute his wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only to God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the reason you also pay taxes, for the, authority, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay all of them their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. There may be questions in this regard, and that's fine, but I want you to feel the force of the church's key teaching here that allows for peace in society. And I would remind you, as you think of questions in this regard, which are very common, to think about how John Paul handled communism, which was not by means of bloody revolutions. So, next one down. All authority derives from God, as Paul noted, God being the word you fill in, derives from or comes from God. By his obedient death, all authority belongs to the Son. Hmm? As it says, much more importantly, in, in Philippians 2, verses 8 through 9, it says there that, and this is, of course, very familiar to us, and being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So by his obedient death, a countercultural reaction to Roman rule, to Pilate, to the Jewish oppression at the time. The countercultural reaction to him was in accord with the Father's will to lay himself down before it, and by doing so, defeated all of it.
The next one down. Civil authority is called to seek the same goals as God's authority. And that usually builds itself out in reality in the next principle down. This one is very nettling to current governments. The next thing down, the way in which the government is called to have the same goals as God is the doctrine called subsidiarity, which forms the question, why must those higher give deference or any consideration to the rights of those lower? Why is that important? Why can't simply might be right is another way to say this. Subsidiarity, the bullet below says, means living in community, carrying out of responsibilities, and the exercise of lawful authority by the smallest units. That's the key, the word smallest, by the smallest units. So subsidiary means living in community, carrying out responsibilities, and exercise of authority by the smallest units of society capable of doing so. Free of usurpation, meaning control, by larger units, which are instead responsible to provide support and assistance. Now, this is like a complicated sentence and a word that is less than fun to try to spell sometimes. But subsidiarity is massively important. It goes to some of the most basic things. Like for example, the next bullet down, it says small social units, especially the family, family is what goes in the line there, have the right to independent existence and function. So my six kids, my wife and I have for the entire period of their life, our oldest child is 18, our youngest is seven. We have homeschooled them. If we lived in Austria or Germany or lots of other places in the world, but to name two major first world countries that supposedly are very advanced in their thinking about everything. If we lived in Austria and Germany, what we've done for 18 years would be illegal and not allowed by the government. People are arrested in those places. Their children are taken away in a couple of places because they simply want to homeschool and teach their children. This is one example of the incredibly practical and real world application of subsidiarity or its failure in that case, is that the job of government, the authority, is not to usurp and be the big brother in control, but to support and aid the smallest possible units functioning in fullness. In the United States, for example, our US states, there are 50, you know, are broken up within them into units that are called counties. Um, like my home state of Maryland has 24 counties. And the authority in the United States, as you know, is the president of the United States. And below that are governors of states. And below that are either mayors of towns or county executives of counties, if the county doesn't have a major town. And it has been the tradition in Catholic education, I'm sorry, the tradition in public education in the US, that the proper authority over education, the main governing authority that generally handles things, is not the federal government, the president level, is not even the state governments. It's the county governments that control education. Public education predominantly is exercised under the authority of county officials, which means that every county has its own school system independent of all others. That's an example of subsidiarity properly ordered. There's lots of bad examples in the US government of it not well ordered. But education is a good example where they presume that the most competent level is the closest level to those being governed and the families being served. And that level is the county government. 
so boards of education and the way things are done are regulated at the county level with some minimal laws from the state level and the federal level that are not intended to usurp or replace, but are intended to try to support and assist county governments and their resources. That's an example of subsidiarity. The next bullet is its opposite. The third bullet down there, it says forced collectivism. That's the word that goes in the line is collectivism. Forced collectivism of any kind violates this principle. Now, if I asked you what's forced collectivism, the most common casual term for it would be communism. And there's lots of types of forced collectivism, but communism is a well-known type. And the church opposes communism firmly on these terms because it is a consistent, seemingly incurable violation of subsidiarity. Not just subordinating the lower government levels to a certain sort of like the labor force, private property, uh, anybody's individual rights are all controlled at the highest level possible in communism. And laws of determined and where your money goes, even in some governments, what you do for your career, you know, your career is pre-chosen for you, what schools and aptitude you have chooses the direction you go in terms of your career. All these things are controlled at the highest level of government. And therefore, in most forms of pure communism, there is no private property. And that means essentially there is no subsidiarity. There's no sense in a government like that, that its job is to support the lowest entity because it's presuming that everything should be usurped at the top. And usually in governments like that, family life, its rights, homeschooling and everything else, its rights, are severely violated in various ways. An example of that is, is the forced abortions in China, right? Is it goes all the way into penetrating the highest level of the government, penetrating the womb and telling you that you must kill your children, right? So forced collectivism of any kind is severely against the gospel call because again, going way back up to the top, society is ordered to the person. The person is not the instrument of society. And the smallest unit, the smallest unit is the husband and wife. The smallest, if you will, governing body in society is the family. And so you could say it this way, that all of society, a rightly ordered society, exists to make possible the thriving of the smallest existing and first human society, which is the family. And any government that thinks a different way will get it wrong and abuse the human, abuse human dignity and come to wrong conclusions and wrong laws to that degree. Subsidiarity is therefore, I hope you see, terribly important as a principle because getting it wrong makes so many things viciously wrong in a society. And the last point in social doctrine is the common good. The common good. How do human rights relate to individuals and the common good? Right? Because again, I mentioned at the beginning, there's a tension there, of like the rights of the person versus the, the society's need for good to occur. A couple points there. There's another S word there under that one, and that is the first line there under that bullet. It's the word solidarity, solidarity, S-O-L-I-D-A-R-I-T-Y, solidarity. This principle under the social doctrine, the principle of solidarity is that the sharing of spiritual and material goods is to be based on justice and Christian charity. The common good this is how Christians define it. The common good is the sum total. That's what goes in the line. The common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow individuals to be fulfilled. Individuals to be fulfilled, not subordinated. 
That's a different way of defining it that you'll find in many government textbooks. Common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow individuals to be fulfilled. In other words, the focus of the common good is to be individual thriving, not smooshing down individuals to subordinate them to some greater good. Because the fundamental thing that social doctrine sees is the dignity of the person, the dignity of the human person, which is why that's first principle of these five principles, respect for the dignity of life, that each individual has value and society should not be organized such to subordinate that value. The last bullet there under that, the word that goes in the length line is the word presupposes. Presupposes. The common good presupposes the good of the person, peace, and security. The reason I say that is because the common good, in the way I've described, cannot be fostered in extreme situations like war. It presupposes peace and security because if there is a lack of peace, a lack of security, then the common good bears out different things. You know, I said I was in the US military, right? And I joined the US military when the first Gulf War broke out um, in January of 1991 before most of you were born, perhaps all of you. And uh, that time period, 1991, was a time when we entered a war that would be very rapid, but it was the war of my generation. I was 19 at that time, and I felt that it was my time to serve. So I joined up, and the Navy was part of my family's history. My grandfather was in World War II in the Navy. And the decision there meant that I went into a society that would define individual rights differently. Most militaries have this, is that as soon as I took the oath for military service, especially in wartime, I was no longer subject as a citizen to the US Constitution, the Bill of Rights, things like that, the right to free speech, the right to protest, the right to um, be imprisoned without having it all explained really quickly, habeas corpus is called. Those rights, once I entered the military, were abrogated and I was under a new thing, a new governing authority that had a different definition of the common good in times of a lack of security and in time of war. In the US, it's called the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice which replaces the constitution for those serving in the military. And it means that as long as I'm in the military, I don't actually have any more the right of free speech. I don't actually have any more the things that the constitution in the US government says, the right of free assembly, the right to protest, is that I give up some of those things under conditions of the need to, in a time of lacking peace and security, defend the nation. And that goes all the way to what you know militaries exist to do. It goes all the way to saying the government could decide to sacrifice my life for the common good, to send me into battle where I will be killed for the common good. So in a time of war and a lack of security, the common good bears a different relation to the individual. This definition of the common good I've laid out to you here in the Church's Social Doctrine, that's why it's very important to note that it presupposes peace and security for this kind of common good to exist, which supports fully the individual's fulfillment. Now below this, these are the five key things that I've gone over of the social doctrine and principles that derive from it. Below this, are what are called the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, which you're all familiar with to varying degrees. Hmm? The corporal and spiritual works of mercy, which flow from social doctrine in various ways. 
which form the way in which the church in its two lists calls you to do what I said in the beginning. It's the specifics, if you will, it's the charter, if you will, of what it looks like to be refined and to aim your life right, to aim your life to become like Christ's and to allow him to shape you for something greater than you would be otherwise, to allow you to have real purpose. This is the charter that defines it, right? The corporal works of mercy, the bodily works of mercy, to feed the hungry, these are all derived, by the way, except for the last one from Matthew chapter 25, from Christ's own lips. To feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to visit those in prison, to shelter the homeless, to visit the sick, and the last one that the church adds, to bury the dead, which is your last line there, to bury the dead. Hmm? On the right side of the spiritual works of mercy, which are less familiar to many Catholics, and this, again, is a charter for a life that is worthy, a life that is well-purposed, a life that is focused on self-gift. All of this presuming that it is done in charity and gentleness. To admonish the sinner, to teach or instruct those that are ignorant or don't know the truth, to counsel the doubtful, to comfort the sorrowful, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive all injury. And the last one, the last line you have to fill in, to pray for the living and the dead, to pray for the living, to pray for the dead in purgatory. These two lists of seven taken together form the charter of the Christian life under the Beatitudes. And I put between them the picture of St. Francis of Assisi embracing the leper. And as you think about that, that painful image of Francis embracing the leper, recognize that he was rich. He was well off. He had a life set before him that was of ease and materialistically free of want. And the thing that broke through all that was not a generic call but a specific man that he encountered, that he got off his horse in a moment of grace and conversion, a moment that would be the hinge point of his life in a way, and took the risk of touching a leper, beyond that of embracing and kissing the leper, and saw the leper not as a disease, not as a category, not as a banished, um, risk to society, but as a person that needed radical love, a radical gift of self, a radical laying down of comforts, a radical step out of the comfort zone. And so he became in that moment as Christ-like as he would ever be, this saint who is known for being perhaps the, the most detailed and depth of pattern of Christ of any saint's life beyond Joseph and Mary. Hmm? St. Francis is not just a saint, he is a saint of saints because his life so precisely followed that of Christ's pattern. The early rule of the Franciscans was little more than quotes from the gospel. Hmm? What are you called to be that would take you actually out of your comfort zone? To point out that at the bottom here of this page, I've listed some things that are sort of some special points of social doctrine that we can't bend on in any depth today, but I wanted to point out as we move into some questions and answers. To consider that the social doctrine, all that we have discussed under these five points, presumes a care for the environment. It presumes that Catholics are environmentalists. Not just because Pope Francis has recently emphasized that in his document, Laudato Si, which is a masterful document, but Pope John Paul, as you might be aware, also wrote a document on the environment, which I recommend you read at some point. One of my master's degrees, as Cynthia noted, is in environmental public policy. 
And that was the direction I thought my life was going. But when I had a deep conversion and became more deeply Catholic, I was raised in the faith but was nominal. When that got fixed in me by God's grace and my wife's help, I realized in studying that all the things that I was in terms of loving creation, loving the environment, were not meant to become some pantheism, but were meant to be fully integrated into my faith as an act of the respect for and love for the creation of the Lord. One of the ways we live that out, of course, we are at Franciscan University. So St. Francis, as you may know, is the patron saint of environmentalists and ecology because of his astounding care for creation, which was not mythic, it was real. The stories about the, the wolf of Gubbio and preaching to the birds and other Franciscans like St. Anthony preaching to fish. These are not apocryphal, they are not mythic, they are real stories. They happened that Francis saw, in a sense, Eden restored in front of him due to his sanctity. The harmony of creation restored in front of him due to his personal sanctity. Around him, in a sense, Eden was restored for a brief window. And we're called to see the environment as not ancillary or a political issue or something that we just kind of like resist as Catholics. Too many American Catholics are very much like that. The environment is sort of like not an issue for them. And that's unfortunate and also wrong. That in my family, for instance, one of the ways that it lives itself out is I teach my boys, I have three boys, three girls. I teach my boys who tend more towards this sort of stuff that they should never kill frivolously. Anything frivolously. You know, like sometimes boys go out there and just kill ants on the ground for fun. That they should never kill and take life frivolously under any conditions. Below that, it says pro-life. We've already talked a bit about that, right? That the dignity of life extends from conception to, to the grave. And that our society, obviously, most societies have trouble recognizing that consistently. But it, it lets you realize, of course, that the dignity of the human person is not related to its size or power, political clout. That those most underrepresented, those least attended to by society, those most powerless have equal dignity. The pro-life principles of the church are the only truly logically consistent way to think. Forgiving enemies, the death penalty. Now Pope Francis has more emphasized this, but John Paul was very much along these lines and Pope Benedict as well of if there's no good reason, if a society can safely incarcerate someone and justly maintain their life, not all societies can, but if a society can safely incarcerate someone in a dignified manner, then there is no reason left to execute because execution is not for the purpose of revenge or I got you or I got you back. It's not for that purpose even though human anger might lead it that way. It's a recognition that crimes do not remove one's basic dignity to life, even if that person has himself or herself done that to others. It also points out the just war idea falls under social doctrine, that under what terms is war considered justifiable? Basically, it's taking the right of self-defense and making it macro. In my home here, Steubenville can have a good bit of crime sometimes because it's a fairly poor area of Ohio. That if someone breaks into my home and threatens my family, as we all know, I would have a right to oppose that person even to the point of killing them, right? Self-defense of my family. The just war doctrine essentially follows the same thought but on a scale of nations, that it is a self-defense principle that justifies war, otherwise it doesn't, that if a nation's life is threatened, then it may defend itself even to the point of killing, like I may defend my home to the point of killing. And there's subsidiaries to that principle, 
like it may even justify first strike under the right conditions. And I welcome you to read the catechism's points on this. But it tells you, it defines for you, again, the church's social doctrines are entirely logical. It defines for you the principles where everything lines up under the same understandings. Otherwise, you live inconsistently. And immigration is the last point I wanted to point out as a special thing, is that it recognizes the right to emigrate with an E, which means to leave your country, <laughs> which presumes that other countries receiving must recognize the right of someone to leave a place of oppression that they can't live under. They have a right to seek a better place. And the country's immigration laws must recognize the right to emigrate, the right of someone to leave a threatening condition and seek a better situation. The immigration laws, we struggle with that a lot right now in the United States and the balance of that because it must be balanced with national security. It's not a simple thing, but it must be considered. So all of these things, to return to where we were, remember the basic point is that your life is ordinary, which is beautiful and good, but Christ desires to refine you by suffering sometimes, by taking you out of your comfort zone on the terms of your trust of him, that you trust him with your peace and joy, that throughout all the struggles to see this as consistent in your life and perhaps the long-term effort to integrate this with your life and your faith, all these principles makes you a person who is whole and able to make beautiful things for the Lord, like the book of Kells, and far past that, in each of your individual lives, all on the terms of do you trust your Lord with your joy? Hmm? He said, I've come to give you joy and joy abundantly. Do you trust that? <laughs>